Oh, great to be with the Campus Disciples tonight. My name is Ryan King, and this is my lovely, incredible spiritual wife, Ayana. And we bring you greetings and good news from administration, amen? You know, when I think of the campus ministry, I think of Colossians chapter 1. We always thank God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you, City of Angels Campus, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people around the world. You know, as we saw that amazing video, 2022 is the year of the Holy Spirit in the sold out discipling movement. And by the end of this year, the Spirit will have sent a historic record 27 church plantings around the world in every single world sector. Ten of those are Operation Eagle U.S. plantings as we evangelize all of the U.S. by the end of 2024. Now, incredibly, the City of Angels Church, through your faith and your deeds, has raised over $51,000 towards the Fall Missions Collection. I'm going to let my lovely wife, Ayanna, share a few key highlights of the giving to date. Amen? I give you Ayanna. Where are the campus ladies at? Are there some teens in the house? Come on, teens. Well, I am a product of the campus ministry, so I love the campus ministry. I studied the Bible at 19 years old. I was a student at University of Oregon doing an exchange in Bowie, Maryland. So I was baptized December 12, 2004. So I wanted to share about this special mission. Um, and things that come to mind are three biblical women heroes. Uh, There is the widow at Zarephath in 1 Kings 17, the poor widow, we don't even know her name, in Mark 12, and Anna the prophetess in Luke 2. Now you may be wondering, what do these three women have in common? Well, I'm glad you asked. So they all are widows, and they all either gave their life, like Anna the prophetess, or all their resources to the kingdom. We have someone in our church who did the same thing. Uh, Her Facebook name is Badia Faithful Bell. Yes. Amen. She's now a widow, and she gave an incredible amount to missions. It wasn't just one, two, three, not even five, not even ten. She get, Badia gave fourteen thousand dollars. So this fall special missions collection. We also have the Martinezes who gave two thousand five hundred dollars. And then you guys saw Miles up here singing, right? His mom is amazing. Stephanie Keys is organizing a love run. So uh, more details to come on that, but disciples can sign up and raise even more money for special missions. So, yes. Special is such an incredible opportunity to showcase your talent, give your heart, and just do incredible things for God. I cannot wait to see how, many, how much more good news we have and how we bring this mission home as a family for our God. Amen. Love you guys. Awesome. Family, I owe my life to special missions, and here's why. I was baptized July 2005 in the Portland church when Kip was restarting the movement. Right after that, I moved one month later as a baby disciple to Eugene, Oregon, which is about a two-hour drive from Portland. And unbeknownst to me, when I got baptized, Kip had sent out the mission team with the Cheramellas to plant the Eugene Church. So you can imagine as a baby, one-month-old disciple in a campus town without a discipling church, I would have totally fallen away. Now, fast forward two years later. I graduate from a, a MBA graduate program, 2007, and, and who comes walking into a campus Devo? A walk-on football player by the name of Tyler Sears. Who leads the San Jose region with his wife, Shay, right now. Now, incredibly, two months before he studies the Bible, he gets into a horrific car accident, which humbles him out, and he's seeking God with all of his heart at that point. He studies the Bible. Of course, he gets baptized in April. Now, two months after he gets baptized, Eugene has a special missions collection. Because of the car accident and the insurance settlement monies that Tyler receives, he gives, as a two-month-old baby disciple, $6,000 to special missions. 
It gets even better. Because Eugene got an extra $6,000, it allows Ayana, when she graduates, to be a full-time campus intern. We leave the campus ministry, we date, we fall in love, the rest is history. And so, not only do I owe my life to special missions, I owe my wife to special missions. So what can God do through the campus ministry? It can evangelize the world. We love you so much, and to God be all the glory. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Judges 8, 18. See, I'm intimidated. When I was at university, I had a mohawk. I was a British punk. You was all too cool for school. But we're going to rectify that tonight. All right, teens, students, love and money. Do you love money? Does money love you? <laughs> do you know how to make it and use it? If you do, you will always master it and it will not have a hold on you. If you don't, it will master you and have a hold on you through greed and debt. In my experience, most teens and students love other people's money. Their parents' money, their grandparents' money, their government's money, their bank's money, their credit cards money, but not their own money because they ain't got no money. This is also true of love. Most teens and students in action love themselves more than their parents and grandparents. I definitely did, especially as a non-Christian. You see, they telephone me more than I telephone them. They gave me better birthday presents than I gave them. Better Christmas presents. I loved myself and expected my government to be there so I could use my government, not support it, and I definitely didn't support my government practically. I disliked the bank when it charged me interest or bank fees. I took money from credit cards and avoided paying it back. I love people with money more than those who look to take from me or cause me to spend it. I mean, maybe it was just me. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe just we're so sinful in Britain. I don't know. As Christians, this trend needs to be reversed. If not, it becomes addictive and harder and harder to change as we grow older. Here's a tip for you. You get into debt as a student, you'll most probably stay in debt for the rest of your life. We need to honor our parents and grandparents. We need to respect and be grateful for our government. Treat banks and credit cards with respect and gratitude to be seen as the most loving, responsible, and generous person in our social group, in our school, in our university, and in our family. Your boys just fainted, I think. <laughs> once, once you earn, here's the thing, once you earn every dollar you spend, you will learn the value of money and time. While you live off your money of your parents, you will value neither money, time, or your parents. While you live off loans and debts, you will never value money or master the key characteristic of self-denial, which is essential for long-term salvation. Loving people is hard without mastering your finances. Who here wants to convert their parents? Who here wants to convert their grandparents? their friends, their peers. It starts with you taking full ownership 
of your life through your finances. No one goes to someone they see as a boy or a girl for spiritual advice. They may go to you if you are a young person with an old soul. Some of you in this room are the opposite. See, it's time to go from being a boy to a man. Let me just deal with the brothers and the sisters will get the hint. Judges 8, 18. Judges 8, 18. Then he asked Zeba and Zeluman, what kind of men did you kill at table? Men like you, they answered, each one with a bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jetha, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jetha did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zebeth and Samuel said, come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camels and necks. The problem here was he was given the opportunity to be a man, but he was still a boy because he was afraid. Now, the problem with this generation is you all want to be superheroes. You want to put on costumes. You want to get these abs. You think if you can do something great, the sisters will like you. But Spider-Man's a boy. Iron Man needs a suit. The only one of them that's any good comes from Australia. That's Thor. <laughs> See, what you all need is some what we call big boy pants. Now, here's the thing. You see, Superman costumes don't have pockets. What do big boy pants have? A wallet! Hold on a second. With money in it! Oh! A driving license! Whoa! A credit card with no debts on it! Whoa! What else is in the other pocket? Car keys! A house key! Maybe it's just me, but in Australia, our teens and students wear big boy pants. Here's the thing. You will never be able to love people in a Christ-like way with a boy-like attitude or a little girl attitude. We are called to imitate Christ as the man, not the boy. We are called men of God and women of God, not boys of God. Yo, there's that boy of God. What the heck? God created a man, not a boy. A woman, not a girl. That was his ideal version of the human being. Keep in mind, all of the apostles expect Peter were boys, but real men in their teens. By their early 20s, they were the main leaders of 3,000 people. By their mid-20s, they led a worldwide movement because they had some big boy pants. Two points. Do you really love your family and friends? Do you really love your family and friends? Ephesians 6, verse 2 says, 
honor your father and mother. Ephesians 6 2, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy your long life. So, you want a good life, right? How are you going with your family? You at odds with your family? They're odds with you? Oh, it's their fault. They persecuted me. Really? What for? Who wants to see their family become Christians? We all do. What will it take? Think of it from their point of view. Is the way you are living making them feel loved? Let me tell you as a father what has made me feel loved and want to listen to my children when they were in their teens and they're now both 24 and they're students. When they started taking ownership for their life. So when we would have time together and talk, it was no longer me talking to them about them getting their life together. It was already together. So I came with no agenda. Because there was no agenda. So I said, well, what's up? And I didn't need to talk about debt or anything like that. And so we could have a chat because their life was together. And I was listening to their success in admiration. When they started paying their own way, they came with gifts. They did not come looking for gifts. When they worked hard and paid for us to go out. You see, when my kids paid for my meals, I felt obligated to listen to them. When I paid for them, I felt no obligation. I remember the first time my son saved up to take me out. It was to see the first Hobbit movie. He said, Dad, I got, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan and everything. He said, Dad, I'm taking you out. I'm like, really? Yeah, the new Hobbit movie's coming out. I'm taking you. I go, amen, son, just great. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm, I was really excited. I was like, and as we drove there, I was like, how you doing, buddy? He had my full attention. He could have said anything to me, anything at all. I remember the first time I paid for my parents to go on holiday. I took them, um, I became a skipper of a yacht, took them to the Great Barrier Reef, took my family up there, and um, my dad just listened to me for four days. <laughs> you see, money talks. Or should we say, money allows you to talk. When they started working hunt, uh, hard, my son is a professional drummer. He's uh, had quite a lot of success. You can see him on YouTube and Spotify and all of that. He studied at music university, set up his own band, released his own albums on Spotify, set up his band as a company, does their taxes, has his own music studio, works full-time job, lives out of home. Does it all. My boy's impressive. When he talks, I listen. Am I talking about my son, you, or nobody? You say you want to convert your parents, listen up. My daughter, top marks. She got an award everywhere she's ever gone. When she studied here, top award. I started to listen to her as knowledgeable because she was an A-grade student. When you do bad at university, your parents are going to listen to you. They want to talk to you about your grades. You want to talk to them about Jesus, they are not listening. You give them A-grades, they may listen. Presently, she works a full-time job getting paid $90,000 a year and studies full-time at the same time as a dietitian. Fail grades fail to convert your parents. Unfinished degrees dropping out is fuel for Satan to fan into flames the bitterness of your family towards God and the church. I picked up an intern who had done one year here and, and sort of failed a second year, got booted off because I just want to go in the ministry. I don't want you. You finish your degree. I don't want to, I wasn't interested. You may not be in the ministry all your life. This is my third time in the ministry. You get a degree. You get a degree. 
His parents love me. I'm the minister that said, get a degree. Um, I think we've got to stop scraping by by working at Starbucks for a few hours. It makes us a hard luck story. And by the way, if you didn't know, just because somebody else works there, there are a lot better jobs than Starbucks out there. It is not the highest paying jobs. When I worked, I looked for the company that paid me the most so I could work the least. Not the easiest job to get. My kids are both non-Christians with lots of opinions. They know if their lives are not impressive and they do not work hard, they will not influence me in my beliefs. And they don't believe in God, and they have quite a lot of opinions about it. But they know if they have no life, I won't listen. My parents and sisters, who are non-Christians, the only reason they have gone from being negative to positive about my life and about God and read my books and listen to my sermons is because my kids are so impressive. They go, we don't agree with this Christianity. Well, they're sort of Christians, but the way you do it. But I cannot deny your kids are amazing. It's just a fact. In short, some of you need to get a life to save a life. Who wants their friends to be a non-Christian? In a world where money <clears throat> and things that buy uh, and things that money buys is king, you only get initial respect from your non-Christian friends if you have some and can take and make some. Because if that's what they want, so if you can't say you can do it, they ain't listening to Jesus. Now, we, may, we need to become great with money and then give it away. Not go, I don't need it because Jesus loves me. <laughs> They're not impressed when you don't have any. When you keep complaining your lack of it and what you do not have or how much you are in debt. Say you can't go out with them because you can't afford it. Or complaining about how your church keeps asking you for money special and it's a burden to you. God expects us to have money. Luke 16, verse 9. I'm just happy having no money. That's a lie. Luke 16, 9, it says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your worldly wealth, and wealth implies that you have some as does spending it when Jesus says, when it is gone. <clears throat> Jesus expects us to have money to win friends, non-Christian friends and Christian friends. This is a salvation issue. You need money to make people feel loved. That's a fact. Presents, pasties, gifts, all expensive. Being a Christian can be expensive. Taking people out for coffee can be expensive. Meals. But the impact can be powerful, even a small amount. I remember studying with a guy from Botswana, Africa. And uh, I didn't know this. I studied the Bible with him when I was in England. And um, I asked him after becoming a Christian, what, what, what was the thing that really motivated you? He said, well, when we had our first Bible study, you bought me the, a coffee. You were the first white man to ever buy me a coffee, ever. From that moment, I listened to you. And I was, I don't know, 24 or something. And he went, and you just don't know. But if I turn up and go, I'm, bro, I'd like to buy you a coffee, but, you know, I'm a disciple. You know, we don't have any money. <laughs> Having a car to pick people up and drop them off. They're impressed. If, the, if, you, don't have, if you don't have a car and somebody has a car, it's a big deal. Let's be honest. When you walk into church and non-Christian, you go... Let's look at the sisters, baby. That's what you do. You go, that's weird. That's what non-Christians do. The girls come in. Can I see a boyfriend here? Let's look at his sneakers. They look like they got holes in them and stink. I ain't black. Guys, this is reality. Okay? 
You go, I wouldn't want a person like that. You were that person. You need money to feel loved. Yourself, to dress well. Have nice dates. Get a car rather than some unsafe public transport. I've lived in this city. There's some scary places in this city. You know what I'm saying? You go, hey, I want you to come out from Southlands. You go, what time are we getting home? 11 o'clock. Love to come, bro. You go, I'll drop you back. I'm coming. They will be influenced if you have it and use it for God. When they see you have a Mercy t-shirt because you actually can afford one. When you go to a Mercy conference, it's home and abroad. Do you understand how cool life is? It's like, man, I went to Manila last year for a conference. I went to Sydney next year. I went to London next year. I said, what would your church do? Nothing. <laughs> I went to the beach down the road. We have good chicken. Man, I'm a globetrotter. When I was a young kid, I was a globetrotter. When you share about how you willingly and generously give and God gives back, it's a language religious people don't understand. I think one of our students, uh, Chantel, she raised, her goal was uh, 1,500 of a special contribution. She raised it and then she was saving up to come to the GLC. And she was saving up and saving up. It cost about three and a half grand to get here. And um, so uh, then she had 2,800. And then Taipei went out early and she's like, you know what, I just, I need to sacrifice the GLC. I'm just going to give that to missions. And she told her non-Christians, I am fired up. You know, we've got a mission team in Taipei. My church actually does something. We've sent out this many mission teams. We're like this. She told her family and friends, she was like bragging in the Lord, man. I'm, I'm you know, I am fired up. They're bored about the conference. Oh, it doesn't matter. They paid for her to come. So she gave 4,300 and had a free, free trip. See, that's the impact. Well, I gave 20 bucks to special. <laughs> I think you, you've got to understand when you share these stories, God coming through through, because you've got to understand God doesn't come through for the religious. So the Haas were coming over and they said, Joe, I know the church is a bit strapped. We're going to pay for our own special contribution, uh, our own flight to the GLC. There's two of them, like three and a half grand, four grand. Don't worry about it, in January. And then, you know, like by June, they're like, we really wish we hadn't said that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the wife was like, Joe, you know, he said that. You know, I said, hey, that was between you and the Lord. Don't you look, don't come to me. I am not the rescuer. God is the rescuer. When did I become God? Okay. I said, I ain't doing it. So they came and they were like this and this and this. Anyway, they went, okay, we've surrendered heart. They're on the way back. They get to the airport in LA. United Airlines go, I'm very sorry we've overbooked the flight. Go, what's in it for us? They said, well, we're going to give you this credit card, which you can use anywhere if you'll take the other flight. You go, okay. $4,300. Now, I thought it was for United. You can use it anywhere. They go, all right. So it cost them three and a half grand. They got 4,300. They put them on a flight with another carrier, Qantas, that left at the same time and arrived in Sydney at the same time. <laughs> they go home to their parents. How was the trip? Made $800. <laughs> I think... One of the great ones for one of our, our teen students, because you know, some of you are like in two brackets right there. Um, he became a Christian and his mom lived five miles, uh, five hours away. She, and uh, you know, he started raising special for the very, very first time. It's like, this church asked me to, what the heck? I'm coming to see this church. Okay. Came down, had to go two hours by car, three hours on. She's got cancer, comes with a wig and everything, quite frail woman. She comes, you go, what the church? She goes, man, but I'm fired up. We're sending out missions. She was like, I've never heard of a church like this. She comes. She goes, mm. Mm. <laughs> She starts coming for a couple of months. She's like, and he goes, GLC, go, I'll help you go to GLC. And she's like, this church is amazing. Can I study the Bible? <laughs> she said about two weeks ago, she got baptized. <laughs> 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 
You need to have money, understand money, and get fired up about money. Point two, and only two points. I would, but I can't. I would, but I can't. Have you got that, bro, I and some, but you don't understand my situation. I just can't. Thank you for the title, Tony. Amen. Matthew 17, 20. Matthew 17, 20. I just can't. I'm a teen. I'm a student. This is not where you come to talk about money. How much money you handle in your teens and how you deal with it determines how you deal with it for the rest of your life. Matthew 17, 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing is impossible for God. Now in reference, he's actually talking here about evangelizing the nations. The mountain represents the nation. So it's actually talking about world evangelism. He's going to the disciples and goes, guys, you think like bread and all this stuff, making loaves is a big deal. He's like, duh, you're going to be apostles. You're going to evangelize the world. And they're like, I don't even understand the analogy. They're like, get into your Bible. I can't. Really? How can you say I can't when God is with you and you believe in the God of miracles? How can you say I can't when you believe in miracles? I can't, and miracles are the opposite. Do you, you understand that? So we study with an atheist. So I don't believe in God because there's no way you can part the Red Sea. You can part the Red Sea because we've got a God. Man can't part the Red Sea. I agree with you. That's why you atheists don't think it can happen. And I don't know if you know, but they recently found a couple of months ago the remains of the uh, Egyptian army at the bottom of the sea. Oh, I believe it now. Here's, I, I, uh, writing another book on I Refuse to Be a Victim. Um, and uh, I studied the victim mentality of miracles in the New Testament. What's different about the miracles in the Old Testament and in the Gospels? In the Old Testament, you had miracles that were part of the Red Sea. They were from the nation often. In the Gospels, every single miracle that was done was for an individual. Everyone. They were personal. Now, you ever thought, yeah, well, the kingdom, God will do great things for the kingdom, but for me, I don't know. Under the new covenant, it's a personal covenant. It's not a national covenant. It's a personal covenant. And if you're struggling with faith, have a look in the mirror. You are a walking miracle. Who gave up smoking here? Who gave up smoking? Okay, who tried to give up smoking before and failed? Okay, right, okay, right, right. You're a, and I could list a hundred sins, right? Like, you're a walking miracle. So you need to go back every morning in the mirror and look at yourself and go, miracle. <laughs> miracle. <laughs> miracle. <laughs> Whatever, for, except for you, buddy, just like, okay. Um, the people who say I can't in the Bible, if you, if you actually type in I can't, Pharisees said to Jesus, you can't get off the cross. He went, oh really? I can't get well. Every time it's I can't, it's not good. Let's call out the I can't attitude. I just went to Auckland and went over there last week. And there's a teen there and um, uh, she gave $10 contribution. And she's one of our best teens. She's a kingdom kid. She's flat awesome, came to ignite and her stuff. You have $10. I go, what if you uh, were asked to raise your contribution? I don't know, $10, $100, whatever. I just can't. I was shocked because I think the sister's pretty important. I had a chat with her. I go, you're off base. She said, well, you've got to understand, I do well, I do my grades, my parents don't want me to work because they think it might you know, affect my grades, and then I work hard during the, uh, the holidays and everything like this. I go, blah, 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 blah. 
Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Every student is lazy. Every student is lazy. Unless you're Chinese. <laughs> we all love our Chinese. They have taught the Anglos in Australia how to work hard. Okay. All right. We, we study till 9 p.m. They're still there at 2 a.m. Do you know what I mean? Like, we can learn off each other. Okay. But I talked to her and, I about, and we had a week of different faith conversations, all this, and I shared all the stories. And she went, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm an, I can't do. So but I never said, how do you go? I said, I've already got a job. I've tripled my contribution. I go, it was easy, wasn't it? I said, yeah, it was just a mind shift. Um, and I thought, are we less demanding of our teens than anybody else? Because if Jesus changed the world with teens, I think that's sin. I think that's sin. He went, you might be 16 or 17. You won't change nations. Not when you're 28. Now. You know, what's an amazing thing about money? What do you spend your money on? Now, I'm an English white guy, so you're going to forgive me on this one, okay? The first day I ever went on with a black sister in London, okay, she had tight hair. I saw her on Sunday, and she had long hair. And I went up to her, and I literally said, okay, I I'm a real English kid. I said, does black people's hair grow that quick? All right. Okay. All right. You're, you're all like, man, you can't say that, right? Okay. I'm using the example of how much of an idiot I was, not how much of an idiot you are, okay? Okay. Here's my point being. How much does it take to get your hair done, sisters? Now, if it was $100 and your, hair, your favorite hairdresser went up to 150 you'd stay with your favorite hairdresser, right? Okay, okay. Here's my point. When life's expenses go up, you deal with it. So when we raise our contribution, you need to deal with it. I can't is really I don't want to or I can't be bothered. It's called emotional laziness. Lazy Gehazi. Go study it out. Difference between you can have a sports person that gets up and is super disciplined. But they'll be adulterous because they're emotionally lazy. They can't control their emotions. There is a big difference between being physically lazy and emotionally lazy. All disciples are taught by Jesus to have a very different attitude, one of shameless audacity. Luke 11, verse 5. This is the attitude that God expects us to have when it comes to going and demanding wealth from other people. Shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. Luke 11, 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me. I have no food to offer him. And suppose one of you inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up and give the bread because of our friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Anyone who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So let's put this into, I know, special contribution. My friend in Taipei needs some food and money and some rent. I'm going to wake your pocket up, my friend. And because my f other friend needs some money. He goes, I'm asleep. I ain't giving you nothing. And I'm going to keep knocking until you give me some. You go, you're upsetting me. And? <laughs> go away. No. 
Think about this. You ever had a beggar come up to you and stand in your way? Got any money? Got any money? Got any money? Get out of my way. Got any money? Got it. He doesn't even answer. Got any money? Got any money? Get out of the way. Got any money? Oh, for goodness sake. I'll pay you five bucks to get off. Three types of people that have boldness. Poor, unrighteous, and righteous. Now, you know which one you need to be. I was uh, getting with a whole load of people, and I was with Hugo Melendez and Chris McCloskey. And I was going through their finances, and I found out they live in the same apartment block. All right? And uh, I said, how much is your rent? And I said, whatever, 2250 How much is your rent? 2200 I said, so you're paying more in the same apartment complex for the same type of... You need to go and phone up your landlord and go, hey, I'm paying too much. My friend over the road is paying $50 less. Give me 50 bucks off. And I said, when he does, then you need to go, hey, my friend in the other apartment just got 50 bucks off his apartment. Give me 50 bucks off. <laughs> Shameless audacity. I think it's special. All of your special really should come from non-Christians. All right, why? Because, well, it should anyway, but you're students, so I mean, you know, figure it out. Ecclesiastes 2.24. Ecclesiastes 2.24. Ecclesiastes 2.24. What did you come to the desert to see? A man to pat you on the back or a prophet of God? I don't know. Ecclesiastes 2.24. A person can do nothing than better to eat and drink and find satisfaction with their own toil. You'd have a good life. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without him, who can find, eat and find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless and chasing after the wind. Have you ever asked yourself, like, why, why do non-Christians get so rich? It's because they get earned money to give to us. Think about it from God's point of view. This guy will not become a Christian, so what use is he to me? The only use he has is making money so the Christian can ask him for it, and then it can go into the kingdom of God. That's what that verse teaches. Money is really easy to make. All you need to use is this incredible tool called Google. So when I lived in LA, all right, I thought, right, I want to do a sponsored event. Typed into Google. Sponsored event that makes the most money. Marathon runner. So I, said, I look at him and go, why? He says, because even if they don't believe in the cause, they want to see you suffer. <laughs> and the average donation is $150. Now, I had never run more than four miles in my life. And as you can see, I'm not exactly okay. <laughs> all right. So... I got some advice and I learned to do the marathon. And then I came to staff and go, I'm going to do the marathon. And they said, how far? 26 miles. And then Sonia Cloquet came out and said, why didn't you do a half marathon? I didn't know there was one. <laughs> okay. All right. The one good thing is the LA marathon is the only marathon in the world that goes downhill. So I had some things on my side. Okay. Then I got $500. Well, now I've got to do it, right? Because I've got money and I, I can't give that back. I raised $5,000 to do the LA marathon. I then went back to Sydney on the mission team and I wore, you know, I had some injuries so I got through the marathon, five and a half hours, wasn't pretty, but I got my medal. I thought, now I want to learn actually, actually to run a whole half marathon. So I ran, I just marked out the course and I actually trained myself to run all the way half marathon. Then I got the students and teased together, you got any money? I went, no, we're going to do a marathon. And it's actually really, really simple. You train one week, first week is you have three days where you, were, where you run one mile. The second week, Two, uh, you run two miles three times a day. The third week, three miles all the way up to 10 miles. And then you don't need to run anymore because your body's fit enough because you only need to run the marathon on the, on the day. I trained them. It was really bonding. And, you know, it was just this exercise. We're all complaining about blisters on Sunday. And come on, it was all like this. The 17 of us as students raised $23,000.
But just before the marathon, some had raised it and some hadn't. So I had a, one of those call centers, you know, you get everybody together and you go, guys, okay, everybody put on the board what you said your goal was. I said I'd raise 3,000, I'd say that. And this one sister came in, you could tell she didn't really want to be there, right, okay. And she came in and said, I won't say her name, okay. Sue, all right, you, you need to come, how much, you, I said I'd raise 3,500. How much you got? 500. But I've only got five minutes to be here. I've, I've got to go somewhere on a date. I said, you ain't going on your date till you get that money. <laughs> Shameless audacity. And I said, and we just sat around and said, tell me, who are the people that have the most money in, that you actually know? Okay? I know my grandmother. But they are major persecutors of the church. And then who's your second? My parents. And they are major persecutors of the church. They hate it with a venom. I said, you need to phone them. She said, no. I said, you need to phone them. She said, no. I said, huh? We need to pray. Pray? Phone your grandparents. Blah, 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 blah. We'll do this marathon. Oh, yeah, we'll give you $2,000. Now your parents. No, no, no. Yeah, we'll give you $1,000. Five minutes of being discipled in a shamelessly old... And I said... Who else do we know that's really rich? And one of the sisters had had gone to a party dressed as Serena Williams, and Serena Williams said, liked it on the Facebook, said, let's get hold of Serena Williams. Now it's like, we were asking, and somebody knew, it was like Justin Bieber or something, we were flat, now we were like Muppets, yeah, I know this person, let's get the telephone book out. Who's in there, the Prime Minister, let's, here we go, baby. $23,000, like that. See, you can sit there and get all ticked off. But if you, don't like, if you don't learn how to master money, later in life, how are you going to deal with disasters? How are you going to deal with mortgage rises? How are you going to deal with car crashes? How are you going to deal with medical bills? These are life skills. The other thing we did is we came here as missionaries, so we didn't have any relationships. So we were in uh, Burbank. And I went, okay, I've got nothing to sell. So I went, I need some things to sell. So I door knocked my whole area. And I went, hey, and if you do on a Saturday morning, normally the, the wives answer the door. And you go, can I just ask you, we're having a yard sale for a charity and for church funds, and I've got nothing to sell. I'm a missionary here. And so do you have anything, you know, like anything you want to get rid of, or maybe your husband wants to get rid of, or maybe something you want your husband to get rid of, <laughs> all right, that we could take and sell in a yard sale. I'll be back next week. We just came around the next week, picked it all up. We had our yard sell $500. Didn't cost me a thing apart from boldness. I was speaking to Rico earlier today. He had a day where he raised $9,000. He plated 100 plates of food and desserts in Hawaii. Priced them at $15 each. Then emailed it off to every friend, anything person he could. Right? And um, then had a day where they made them and then they sold them all. And it was like $15 and donations for the fund. On that day, they grossed uh, $9,000. See, somewhere in the world, there is somebody with a better, worse situation with you with a better answer. You go, well, they're all great. When I came here, I said, okay, I'm just going to put this into um, uh, Google. I said, okay, how can teens make money in Los Angeles? And it just came up, ways to make money. And this teen said, I live in Orange County and I started tutoring when I was 15 at $15 an hour. And he basically went to school and go, hey, does anybody want their young kids to be tutored? And so he'd do two hour slots, 30 bucks, okay? And then he started to put his price up as he got a good reputation. You can do two hours on the way back from school, five days a week, $200. I can see the time is short. I got a lot of analogies. I'll say this. Um, our teens in Sydney give $100 a week contribution. They all give 1500 special minimum. All our students nearly give $100 a week. Why? Well, there's three types of students. There's the international students like the Chinese students. Their parents have a serious amount of monies and give them a serious amount of money. They normally give two to $300 a week. Did you hear that bit? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> we have our local students that live with their family, okay? 
Well, you don't have many bills. You have the greatest opportunity to give the largest amount. But you would need to work in the community, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have those people that actually you know, support themselves out. But I've got a million different uh, ways you can do it. Let me just encourage you. On Google, there are so many ways that you can make money. We've had people persecuted, kicked out. Some of our brothers work from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. and they can do a full day thing. They earn 20 hours a week. They'll earn $600 a week. Yeah, what about my school? I, I tell you, there are very few people that actually use every hour. Don't look at YouTube. Don't look at Facebook. Don't lose. That's just the truth. Um, even the teens. You know, uh, Mayor Lovecheck just raised $600 to go to Ignite by getting cookie dough for a dollar and selling it and door knocking the area. People who made money at university and learned how to make money at university and end up actually not finishing their degree because they thought, I know how to make money so much it's not worth me finishing the degree. Bill Gates. Larry Ellison, Oracle co-founder. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO. Dell founder, Michael Dell. Twitter founder, Jack Dorsey. Fashion entrepreneur, Ralph Lauren. CNN founder, Ted Turner. Dole Food CEO, David Murdoch. I'm not saying drop out. I'm saying if you don't know how to make money while you're in university, you've got to understand you go to university to learn how to make money. That's why you go to university, to get a degree to learn how to make money. But some of you will never work in the field that you study because the jobs won't be there. So if you fail to learn how to make money while studying, you will fail in life. You will fail in life. To finish, love and money. Do you really love your family and your friends? How you are now determines the future of your family and your friends. And I would, but I can't. Really, is that the attitude of a disciple? Everything we're about is we can. We will and we must. Amen. Wow, thank you so much, Joe. That was incredible. All right, well, now it's time for the baptism, which is awesome. <laughs> Here we have Lene Covita from UC Santa Barbara. She's 19 years old and she's a biology major over there at UCSB. Um, and Lene, I'm just. really, really proud of you. You are such an amazing woman and you have such an incredible heart for God. And I, I, I want to just share a scripture. I want to keep this brief, but I want to share a scripture in um, Psalm 84. In verse 10, it says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And I really want to encourage you, never forget this day. This is the best decision that you could ever make in your life. Again, I'm so proud of you. I love you. All these girls here and everyone here is about to become your family. And now we're going to have Giselle share for her. so excited for you, Lene. I wanted to share a scripture with you. In Romans 5, verse 3, it reads, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured on, out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And you, like, through studying the Bible with you, firstly, has been a joy. Uh, but just to see you persevere in your relationship with God and really just fight for your relationship with God and your Bible studies has been so encouraging to me and to all these lovely ladies as well. Um, and it's been so encouraging even when you undergo persecution 
like you just really stood your ground and I'm so proud of you. You're like, hey, I have convictions on why, like how to have a relationship with God and how to uh, be saved and why baptism is important. I was like, this girl's gonna change lives. But I'm so proud of you, Lene. Love you. <laughs> and now we're gonna have Lene share. Um, yeah, my name is Lene. Um, I just want to say I'm so excited to get baptized today to, um, <laughs> um, to receive a new family, to um, be able to have the opportunity to accept that great gift of salvation that God offers to each and every one of us. Um, I'm so happy to do it. Um, the scripture that I wanted to share that I'm sure that we're all familiar with, um, 1 Peter 2.9 but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a, royal, uh, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Cause that's what it is, it's a marvelous light. Yeah, I'm so excited and thank you. <laughs> Lene, I have the two most important questions of your life. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sins, resurrected on the third day, and now sits at the right hand of God? Yes. What is your good confession? Jesus is the Lord. Because of your good confession, we can now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All your sins will be forgiven. You will get the gift of the Holy Spirit, and your name will be added to the book of life. <laughs> Greetings from the mighty East region. some great news because we have Miss Sydney over here from the Cal State LA ministry that has come to get baptized. And, and Sydney is an incredible person. We actually just met not too long ago and she's been studying the Bible and I'm just so amazed by you, Sydney. Um, even today, we came a little uh, after the time that we started because we were with uh, uh, one of her family members and she was getting persecuted. And she had to make a decision in that moment, like, was she going to wait or was she going to stand up for the truth? And she decided, you know what, I'm going to go pray. And, ah! and she, she went to go pray. She went to go pray and then she came back and I did. I could not believe my eyes. She had her bag with her clothes ready to get baptized. And she told her family member that I love you, but... I know that God is with me and I want to stand up for the truth. And so and so Sydney and so Sydney, I just want to tell you that I'm I'm so proud of you. Like in that moment I was holding back tears. Like I I was just so amazed. It was a miracle, you know, and you know, being being with our baby sister Fiorella and it was incredible just seeing her joy and of course the sisters behind you. We're your family, and, and you're going to have more family in front of you, right? And so with that, uh, we're going to have uh, Gina share, and then Cindy will get the chance to share. Thank you, family. Uh, I'm so excited for you. Um, just something that I really, that I saw while you studied the Bible was that you were so humble, asking so many questions. Um, every Bible study, you're like, I have a question, I have a question. Because you're a woman that wants to know the truth. You're a woman that has great convictions, and you're just going to make so much great disciples that have great convictions. Yeah. So I'm so proud of you. And I love you. I'm going to let Cynthia share now. Hi all, my name is 
Sydney. And I'm ready to enter the kingdom. Um, I first met a disciple in the Cal State LA Library. I was overhearing Brandon. He was. He was speaking to a gentleman about Bible study. I was like, oh, Bible study. And I was I was lost at the time. And now I've and now I've known the truth. And whenever I ask questions, whenever I seek, I find answers. And and, um, I would I'm thankful for the women that took the time to study the Bible with me and to um, give me those answers. And I believe God is with me and I'm ready to be a disciple. Uh, I'm asking you two important questions of your life. Do you believe that Jesus is son of God, died on the cross for your sins, resurrected on the third day and is now sitting on the right hand of God? Yes, I do. What is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Because because of your good confession, now we can baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and now your sin will be forgiven, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and your name will be added to the Book of Life. Man, what an incredible devotional we've had tonight. Wow. This is one for the record books for sure. Thank you, Dr. Joe Willis, for flying all the way from Sydney, Australia, to minister to us in a great, powerful way. Oh, man. I believe that we were called today to grow up, to mature, to make sure that our life talks so we can have a life to save a life, amen? Do you really love your family? I love that. Do you really love your friends? Do we gotta make sure that in all areas of our lives, students, especially in our academics, that we are examples? The kingdom and the great thing we do as disciples should never be an excuse. Rather, as a Christian, it should be the greatest catapult that leads you to do even greater things. Who should be the greatest students in their classes? We got the Lord is bringing the student athletes, amen. Who should be the greatest athlete on that team? A disciple, a disciple. So when you go back for the holidays, the holidays are about to come, and you go back for Thanksgiving, and you know the first question they're going to ask you, how's your grades doing? And you go in there, you're like, you know what, man, I I got them right here. I got them right here. And now you got their attention, and now you get to preach the word, amen. Um, I appreciate the second point. I would but I can't. Uh, Man, we serve a God that is limitless, and we can limit God sometimes. Uh, I feel inspired. I feel this. I want to call my sector leader. He's here, you know. I I, I report to him, do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm I'm ready to really just like go go all out, go all in for the Lord, you know what I mean? See what God is going to do, what God is doing here among us, guys. This is the future of the movement. You, you are the future. But the future is the present. And we were challenged today. Let's get rid of the word can't from our vocabulary. That's not a disciple speaking. With the Lord, we can. I'll give you my wife. Thank you so much.
much, uh, Dr. Joe Willis, for that amazing lesson. I want to comment on, do you really love your parents and friends? And uh, I was so convicted. I'm sure that all of you guys were convicted because I thought, wow, when he was talking about uh, how your parents view your life, you know, how do your, like, do, would your, would your friends love to, you know, to have your life? Mm. And um, it just made me think of just like, does my life shout like Jesus is Lord? Does my life reflect Jesus? And um, it, it made me think of when I was in campus, okay, this is probably a long time ago. I'm going to age myself, but like 21 years ago when I was in the campus ministry. And I remember before becoming a Christian, some of my fears were um, getting good grades and money. And then after I became a disciple, I started seeing that after I started putting the Bible into practice, I started getting good grades because <laughs> I started living out the Bible, right? So I, I started getting good grades and, and I was still studying the Bible with a lot of women. I was a nanny. I was working part time. And, and, but, but I graduated with a 4.0 and, and I gave... It really left my, my family no excuse, right? Like they couldn't say, what are you doing? They knew that I, I was still shining, right? And with money, we had special missions back then, 21 years ago. And I remember having that relentless faith, like I'm gonna give $1,000 above our goal. And then what happens is that I get this like surprise uh, check for like, like a little over $1,000 because financial aid happened to make a mistake. I'm like, God is so awesome. <laughs> so sisters, I wanna challenge you to have that relentless faith. Go after it, do things that scare you and God will give you way more than you ever imagined. I love you guys. There you go. You know, if you're visiting tonight, uh, you did not come to a social club. Uh, you did not come to a watered down Christian club. You came to a group of students who are excellent in their studies, are excellent at their life. They love the Lord. They want to change this world. And I hope that you want to study the Bible and do the same thing in your life. I want to challenge you to do that this very week. Some of you, some of you raise your hand and say, I'm not baptized yet. Let that change here in the next couple of days. When you come back next Devo and say, I was baptized last week at the congregation of Devo. We're going to have one final song. After the final song, we're going to be escorted out to go see the incredible baptism. We love you guys.